And joining us now, she's the head coach, of course, at Fordham. They're on a roll right there, one of the contenders, as they usually are, that great program over there in the 810. I speak of Melissa Inoue, joining us here in In the Circle. Uh, coach, how you doing? Good, how are you? Thanks for having me, Eric. Doing good. Let's talk about the season for your team. You're on a roll. You've been playing some very good softball. What has it been like playing up in the Northeast with, obviously, the season that has been unique in, in the sport, obviously, with everything, with protocols and things like that, and you know, your team is playing on a, a, right now. It's gotten over 20 games in. You're 20 and three as we talk. Uh, just kind of describe where you feel you're at right now. And are you surprised you're at, not just from a performance standpoint, but, you know, how things have gone so far? Yeah, I think it dates back to the fall, Eric. You know, we were allowed to come back in the fall and we had about – good eight weeks of training and uh, although we weren't able to do our normal eight fall games in the scrimmages we were able to kind of do a lot of inner squads so we kind of did a maroon and white uh, world series type if you will so we got about five or six inner squad days but we did a lot of live at bats and i know my staff and i and our team and our leadership group we felt really good after the fall you know we felt we had a lot of veteran leadership and and some good new freshmen that added to our, our makeup if you will and then kind of Went right back at it in the spring. Our, our semester started a week and a half later than normal. Uh, so we started February 1. But of course, Eric, we had two huge nor'easters come through. So we actually didn't even start practice till I think the third day of the spring semester. And we had about a weekend of practice. And then we had a university pause uh, with our COVID cases. So kind of a unique start to, start to the spring. But I think because of our prep work in the fall, we weren't that nervous. Um, but, you know, during the two-week pause, a lot of, more than half of the team went home to the area, stayed with their training, and, and we came back, and we had about four days of practice, and we fed them to the Wolves and played four games right away and, and probably some tough conditions, but uh, not totally surprised in where we're at. Um, I think we've, like I said earlier, we had a lot of veteran leadership and a lot of, a lot of talent. If anything, it just goes to show you the depth of our team this year. Uh, which is very exciting. We've been able to win in multiple different ways. But, yeah, it's been fun to sit back and watch. And and hopefully my job as a head coach and our staff is not to screw things up right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you're doing more than uh, – you're doing just fine with that. Uh, I'm just kind of curious. So take us through this now. When did you feel confident you would be able to play this year and as a league in the Atlantic 10 in the process of not only figuring out can you play non-conference games and then once you figured out you could play some non-conference how do you come up with a non-conference schedule but also coming up with this conference schedule yeah I think you know the Atlantic 10 actually made that decision back in the late May of last summer about kind of this two-pod system if you will and then my administration did a great job kind of updating me on where we're at. You know, I think I probably made three major revisions to our non-conference uh, schedule. We normally would fly five or six of the first weekends. And then that changed to coach, you're going to have to do bus trips, no flights. And then that changed to, hey, you're only going to be able to do um, overnight trips for conference play. So once that happened, that kind of really changed the normalcy of our normal preseason. We usually like to play a really tough schedule, but um, we're fortunate. We have a great facility. I think it's one of the best in the Northeast. It, it's, um, we have lights, we have turf outfield, we have the ability to hit inside cages or outside. Um, so I just sent out uh, some emails and some text messages and everybody wanted to come down and play us. So that's great. I um, mean, we've had a, a lot of home games and I, and I tell our players that this is very unique and that you probably will never play this many home games again, moving forward, uh, should things move back, you know, but, um, my staff and I did a great job. And just as soon as we, kind of got news of different things changing and we would pivot right away and make the most of our scenario and, and try to find um, competitive games in the area um, and try to honestly simulate what our four game series in the conference play is going to be. Um, so like that situation of Maine, we were not able to play Army due to COVID restrictions. And then I know the Maine coach well and said, hey, this would be a great test run for us. So we did a double Saturday, double Sunday, and it was honestly a great kind of practice run prior to the A-10 starting up because four games is – is different. My only, only my assistant coach who played at Dartmouth in the Ivy League is familiar with what a four game series feel is, you know, and so our job, I think, as a staff right now is to find ways to keep them motivated, as well as to try to keep them as fresh as possible for a four game series, whether it's a double double format, or a one two one so um, but we knew that with our depth of our pitching staff the uh, four game series would benefit us, um, whereas maybe other programs only have two or three pitchers that they're trying to roll with but you know, we've got six. Um, so and I'm probably not giving everybody enough innings, right, to keep them happy. But uh, I guess that's a good problem to have. It is. Uh, and you mentioned it, it, it. Some of your series, you're playing double headers two days to get the four games in. Some of them, you're not. 
Uh, just take us through how that decision is made. That's wild. I've had two to play t- two double headers and two days, basically get four games in. Uh, mm-hmm. you're not the only league that's playing four game series, but you are one of the few that's doing that where you're playing double headers on two days. Just take us through that process. Cause that has got to be unique from a coaching standpoint to have four games in two days. Yeah. When I was a head coach at Iona in the Mac, um, we did play a double header Saturday, double header Sunday, but that was against two different opponents. Um, so that was already tough enough to prepare, but when you're playing the same person four times, like you said, over that format, the A-10 recommendation format is two and two, but you have the flexibility to do one, two, one. Um, I think it just depends on facility. I know with us, Fordham, being an academic school, we have a, a pretty strict absentee policy. So I can't do the one, two, one format every Friday because we've already missed some Fridays. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of maybe balancing maybe this opponent, where we are in the season. Um, but yeah, it's definitely uh, creative because I think across the board, everyone's doing a mix. I don't think anyone's doing just straight double double. I think it just depends, but um, it's a luxury. I think with our, the amount of pitchers that we have, we're, we're able to kind of spread it out, if you will, and not have the same pitcher four games in a row. Cause that's tough. Yeah, I would say so. But you mentioned your pitching staff, you're deep, uh, 2.27 ERA, but you've got five arms you can throw, and obviously one in particular in Devin Miller, who's made headlines here uh, recently with her performances against LaSalle. But just talk about the depth first of your pitching staff and how you were able to develop to have this depth pitching, which a lot of programs don't have this in, in major conferences, let alone uh, the entire sport. Yeah, we actually have six pitchers. Just one hasn't gotten any action yet as she's battling I'm back from a uh... – a surgery, um, but she'll bring a different di- a dynamic as her as she's a lefty. But um, our fifth year pitcher, who was the you know A10 uh, pitcher of the year and the MVP in 2019, uh, Madison Augenbog. So it's a it's a pleasure to have her back for a fifth year and how much experience and you know she's definitely a winner. I mean that's all the kid does is win and you know she brings a ton of experience. And then um, you know a, a junior that's or excuse me a senior that's been adding a lot of depth this year is Anne Marie Prentice you know had kind of battled some injuries previously but she's kind of quote unquote been like a game three starter for us and has done great I think she's thrown back to back shutouts um, again gives gives like a different compliment and then our junior Mackenzie McGrath who's more of a relief role and a closer for us um, but again they're all all six pitchers bring a different dynamic and then obviously Devin got the ball quite a bit last year as a freshman and got experience right away. And then, you know, I think her consistency with the experience of last year is, is showing right now. Um, and then a freshman, Bailey Enoch, who's much like Madison Augenbog and being a two-way player can hit, play another position and pitch. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to have the depth. Then Gianna Ranieri, like I said, who's, you know, battling back from a, a, an injury in the fall. Um, but yeah, all six. And I think that's helped out us offensively as well, because in the fall, our hitters were facing six different pitchers, you know, on a weekly basis. So it's not like somebody can just sit on this kid. She's a curveball. It's, you know, there's six different motions and delivery and timing and movement and speed coming at you. So I, I, I definitely think that has helped us out offensively. And I think our numbers have shown this year so far. Miller, of course, I mentioned two perfect games against LaSalle. There's eight, been eight per, uh, perfect games in the history of Fordham softball Miller now, she's got two of them. She did it in back-to-back starts. Uh, she joins, obviously, the, four, the great two-time All-American and Hall of Famer Jen Manu. When you think Fordham softball, she's the first thing to come up. That you're, You know you're doing well when you're being brought up with Jen Manu. What, what's kind of clicked for her this week? I mean, that's national news to throw. It's one thing to throw one perfect game, but to do it back-to-back and be so dominant, uh, very impressive for the young sophomore. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it, her success is attributed to what she put in in the summer and the winter break. Um, I think she took, you know, some lumps last year against some really good competition and learned right away that, hey, you have the pitches, but it's about strategy. It's about, you know, knowing how to pitch and, and the strategy of pitch calling. And so um, I've actually taken over the pitch calling this year for her. Um, but, you know, it's a tandem, you know, whatever I maybe give as a sign, she has always the ability to shake me off. And I think during the perfect game, uh, two of them. I think she, I think she maybe shook me off once or twice, but you know, I'd rather have the pitcher throw a pitch with conviction and belief than maybe a tentative, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, it was fun to watch. I mean, that was, I told her after the post game Friday that that was the first perfect game I've been a part of. I've been a part of no hitters, but not um, a perfect game. So it was, it was pretty neat. And I think the team enjoyed the perfect game more on Saturday because we got to celebrate it defensively. Whereas, Friday was a, you know, a walk off uh, a base hit or something like that. So it was, it was pretty neat to see a player 
be that poised on the mound in that rhythm, you know, and, and uh, I think our team is fairly superstitious as well as um, a couple of my coaches and I. So, you know, we tried to like not talk to her in, in the dugout. Kids were leaving her alone, but it, it was fun. And she just, you know, to see a kid smile and have that much success and joy and truly compete every pitch was, was pretty neat to sit back and watch. And, you know, my job, of course, was not to hopefully, you know, mess up the uh, perfect game by calling the wrong pitch or something. But well, yeah, she did a lot of really good pitches. I was going to say, you're doing it back-to-back -back games. I mean, what is that like to go through that a second time? Do you, I mean, are you aware that, oh, we're, are we doing this deja vu again? Are you, are you sitting in the same smashing superstition? Are you sitting in the same spot you did the previous game? Are you calling a sim? Like, I mean, take me through that, that you're all, you know, the, I mean, it's one thing to throw one, but to throw it a second game as that's going on, what's going through your mind? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. One of our catchers is banged up right now. So as the starting catcher, Amanda Carey, was, you know, getting a sandwich and going to the bathroom, <laughs> you know, I actually helped warm up Devin on Friday. Uh, I, I catch for our pitchers quite a bit. I gear up. Uh, me being a former pitcher and catcher, I, I, that's the best seat in the house. So I actually warmed up Devin on Friday. Um, and then I joked on Saturday with, the, with the, um, one of the players that were warming her up. I said, hey, why don't you go get a sandwich? I said, it worked yesterday. Let's do this again. And so I took over about the same um, time, timing of her warm up. So I joked with Devin. I go, well, you threw well yesterday. Let's do it again. And so, uh, yeah, I just caught for her. And you could tell she was pretty loose. And, um, and that's the type of personality she is. But she is a bulldog when it comes between the white lines. You know, she's a competitor, wants the ball. And, um, yeah, it was fun. I mean, I kind of realized that, like, oh, wow, she hasn't given up a hit yet. But as far as the perfect game, it honestly didn't dawn my mind until I think our one of our facilities guys was standing above me in the stands trying to get a video. And obviously I knew what he was trying to do. And I just, you know, was like, pay attention, stay in the moment, you know, be present and, uh, you know, don't screw up this number, uh, number sign call to her. <laughs> you realize now as a bullpen catcher, you have to do it now, like every game now. You have to do it every, <laughs> like, like you're done. Now you're like, you're stuck. Like you have to do it. Like you get, and you got to make sure the sandwich is, you know, is grabbed. Wherever you're at. I actually catch all the pitchers on Thursday for their pregame. Like if we're playing on a Friday, their pregame bullpen, because I usually try to rest. I usually try to rest our other um, starting catcher. Like I said, our other one kid's banged up right now. But, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't mind catching. You know, I'm getting old. I usually sit on a bucket now, but um, I think it's the best view. You're right. No question about that. Does this staff complement each other best? Like of all the staffs you've had, they seem to complement each other. They bring some different to the table and they seem to complement each other very well on and off the field. Is that accurate? Yes, definitely. I, and I think that started in the fall. You know, I, I had, had talked to them in the fall saying that, you know, we're a really deep staff and this is going to help us um, with the four game series. And that was something that I think they bought in and understood and realized that that's a strength for us this season. And I said, you know, whether your role is to come in for one pitch, one out, one inning, you know, whatever it might be. Um, now that's not to say that some of them don't want the ball more for sure. You know, what pitcher doesn't. Um, but I think they all realize their strengths and even defensively, maybe when they match up better against a particular team. Um, but yeah, it's been tough to manage this year. Um, but we started doing a lot of like staff mentality bullpen workouts in the fall, something that I really hadn't done my first two years here because we didn't have as many arms. Um, but yeah, I think we've just made it a point from the beginning that this is going to be a really big strength of us and no one in the A-10 is going to have this depth like, like we are. No, no doubt. And you've got an offense to complement it as well. You're hitting 332 as a team so far uh, during this season here, 546 slugging. Who's been your leaders offensively, uh, not only from a production standpoint, from a leadership standpoint that has stood out so far for you? You know, it's been kind of a shared wealth, if you will, but a lot of that starts from my staff. You know, Katie Meckacker and my assistant heads up a lot of our offense, and then uh, Coach Matt Clampert assists a lot in the hitting. And, you know, we talked to the staff in the summertime that I said, you know, I'm going to have to pay attention to the bullpen a lot. We've got five arms. I said, I'm not going to be in the cages very much. And, and so I think that's been awesome for me to be able to focus all of my attention in the bullpen and then them to taking over the offense. So credit to them because they're either front tossing a ton, um, you know, doing video delay machine work. Um, but really the wealth has been shared uh, one through nine. I think almost everyone in our lineup has a home run right now, which is pretty cool to see. Um, but I think we have found kind of a lineup that works for our strength. Um, we've got our two slappers and triple threat kids toward the bottom. And then we've got more of our contact and power kids from one through five. Um, but I, I think a big thing having, um, you know, Madison Augenbaugh back again this year, again, she has so much experience 
Um, Sarah Taffet and Julia Martin have only gotten better since getting here at Fordham. They played a lot as a freshman and just to see those, I mean, Sarah Taffet's leading our team in home runs right now with six, I believe. And yep. she's not normally a power kid, but that just goes to show you the development in the last two years for her and Julia. Um, and then having Rachel Hubertus back from a knee injury in, in 2019 has been huge. We didn't really quite have a, a four hole uh, hitter last year. Um, you know, we had a couple kids that were hitting, maybe they were, they weren't best suited for, but now with Rachel back in the lineup, everyone is hitting where they, where their strength is. And then, you know, added a couple of, a couple of freshmen and, and um, Bella Ayala and Bailey Enoch have been able to swing and, you know, add some power and some experience. And then our pitchers, whether it's Anne-Marie Prentice on the mound or Devin Miller, I'm a huge um, person that likes pitchers that can hit for themselves. I think it adds a different dynamic and it allows us to DP somebody else in the lineup. Um, so I'm a fan of pitchers that hit. And I think all of our pitchers, for the most part, other than McGrath, they swing for themselves, which is which is nice to have. Yeah, it gives you depth on the roster, gives you some different options you could play with from a roster standpoint, from a flexibility standpoint in-game as far as making moves. It's huge advantage. And you got Anne Marie who has three homers uh herself there. Uh mm -hmm. Devin, you know, Devin's hitting 333 and hurt when she plays and she hits. I mean, that's a good balance. And you've seemed to have that balance that pop to go along with the speed that you got with Pincho with 13 steals and Maddie has 10 steals. Uh, so you've got this balance here where you can steal bases and manufacture runs, put pressure on your defense, but you also have some pop. Yeah, I think that's something that we've, you know, said right away from I think our first game of the year against Army, you know, to not play in almost a year, an exact year, but to win in a walk-off fashion against, you know, a strong Army team out of the Patriot League. We were kind of like, whoa, if this is any indication of how our spring's going to be, like, that's pretty cool that our first game of the year is a walk-off win being down four to two. And we used three pitchers that game, you know? So it was pretty neat. I think that first game showed that we could win with power, win with speed, win with, you know, small ball, and then winning by whether it was pitched by committee or, or a pitching plan, if you will. Um, but yeah, it's been pretty cool. And I think our team realizes, you know, anytime we do a post-game talk, we're, we're winning in multiple ways. We're not just winning with the long ball, which maybe that's what we did in 2019. Um, but we've been able to prove in different games that it's not always the long ball. It's, you know, the ability, maybe it's a squeeze, maybe it's a sack bunt when we needed it. Um, you know, I think we've done a tremendous job with two out hitting right now too. That's been great. Um, but yeah, it's been kind of a, a fearless um, offensive lineup and it's been really cool to sit back and watch them have so much success and all their hard work pay off. Let's talk about your coaching journey. You played at UNLV. Uh, what, got you interested in coaching after you were done playing at UNLV? So actually a story, I was a walk-on. I didn't, I went, just went to school my first year, uh, kind of decided to take a little bit of a break. I grew up as a, as a pitcher and I think maybe got burnt out towards the end and maybe I wanted to take a break or maybe questioned if I was ready for that next level. And, and obviously I, I definitely missed it after my first year at school and was friends with players in the softball team and sophomore year I decided to try out. I redshirted that year and then you know, was proud to kind of work my way in the lineup as a DP first baseman and then started my last two years every game and then actually had to catch my senior year due to an injury and, and, a, and a player leaving. So it was pretty cool. I'm definitely blue collar when it comes to that. And um, that's definitely my work ethic and my style. Um, you know, I was able to be on scholarship my last two years and then a captain. So I don't even think my players know that story. I think slowly through all these interviews, they're maybe trying to are now starting to hear it. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's who I am. And, um, but you know, UNLV has always been kind of a ninth aisle, if you will. I'm originally from Hawaii and there's always a ton of people from Hawaii going to Vegas. Um, so every weekend I had family visiting. So it really wasn't like I was away from home. I would like run into like my second grade teacher, my auntie, my uncle, my cousin, which in Hawaii, everyone's related somehow. So, um, but yeah, and you know, they were a strong program. Um, you know, uh, back then, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of, that was kind of my journey as a, as a student athlete. That that's pretty rough. So you, you ended up playing there, mm -hmm. you get into coaching, uh, which there's something in the water in UNLV. Cause a lot of people that end up playing UNLV go into coaching now, especially head coaching jobs, but like, what, what, what decided you to get, stay in the game and go into coaching law? Cause you would go into some journeys here, different jobs. You, I mean, it's not easy to just get into coaching. You got to be able to be flexible and maybe have to move from place to place to an, end up where eventually you want to end up basically. Yeah. I, you know, I think growing up, um, my dad was a big influence on me on, on baseball and, and softball. He was one of my first coaches and still is a coach, even though I'm, you know, over, over 20 years in now, but, uh, 
yeah, just kind of grew up loving the game, whether it was baseball, softball, knew how to score a game. Um, there's a huge Japanese influence with the game of baseball back in Hawaii. There's also a big men's fast pitch league with the military um, back home in Hawaii. So I was exposed at a pretty young age. I think I started when I was nine and I just always had a knack for a game. And I think growing up as a pitcher and catcher, I was in leadership positions and really enjoyed it. And so I kind of knew I was always going to be in a coach. And then I had the opportunity to be a student assistant while I finished up at UNLV and loved it. Um, and then I was fortunate that through networking, I was able to get my first job at Northwestern State and, uh, you know, haven't really looked back since 2003. It's, it's been an awesome journey and one that I remember like it's yesterday, but now I'm about 20 years in almost. Yeah. I mean, and you're not like the only rebel. I mean, what is it? Uh, Maggie Laverie who's at the head coach at Boise State's now Maggie Huffager. She's from UNLV is a head coach. What Linda Garza, I believe. Uh, uh, Fresno State. Yep. It's not Fresno State. What is, I mean, that's a pretty wild tree there to be a part of there. Yeah, I think, it, and you look back at all of them, um, just if you were to remember watching them play, like Linda was a five foot one infielder that played like she was six two, you know, with that much heart and grit and confidence. And then Maggie was a catcher as well. So I think I'm partial in that catchers make the best coaches having, you know, seen the game behind us or excuse me, in front of our eyes. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, it's pretty cool. And we all three uh, stay connected to whether it's a text message or out recruiting and, you know, it definitely once a rebel, always a rebel. So it's, it's pretty nice to have that. And then even uh, Kendall Fern, associate head coach yeah. at Indiana um, and a couple others, um, but definitely uh, something must be in the water there in Vegas. I'm saying, I mean, I'm just saying that's kind of a good wild tree there. It's a pretty cool deal there. Now, you mentioned Northwestern State. You went from there. You spent time at Kentucky. You spent time at Southern Miss. And then I think a pretty big, important turning point, you went to Fordham and joined Coach Orchard, which I would imagine that that stint with Coach Orchard probably helped you once you came back here to become the head coach after she went to her alma mater at Villanova. Yeah, both of my sisters were here in the New York area at the time, so I had a at a point in my career where I said, you know, I could do personal and professional at the same time. And that's really hard to do as a coach. And so I made the journey and I felt, you know, in my coaching profile, it'd be cool to be a part of a private school that had had a lot of success, um, you know, build a different recruiting network. And, and it was awesome. You know, um, Bridget was super cool to work with, uh, super competitive and got to kind of learn, you know, how gritty and how competitive and how she formulated a schedule and, and, uh, you know, how she prepared her team. So it was awesome. But I definitely think that stint here and then obviously, you know, being a part of a private Catholic Northeast school, I think allowed me to get the job over at Iona and had success there and then was able to come back when Bridget and I have stayed in touch. And, and so definitely humbled and honored to be back and to, to follow in her big footsteps for sure here at Fordham. You mentioned you went to Iona, you became the head coach there. You went six years there, had great success. You were coach of the year in the MAC there uh, a couple times. You also led them to the regular conference championships. You got them into the NIC tournament as well. Uh, you got them to the, all the postseason there. Just take me through that process once you got that head coaching opportunity there in Iona. And, and did you ever think that would come, that you would get a head coaching job? Yeah, you know, it took a while. Uh, I had interviewed for some head spots beforehand and just, you know, with timing's everything, I think, and everything happens for a reason. I think I was much more prepared when I got the Iona job and I think it was the right fit for me. Um, very family oriented there. Um, you know, you had to work hard, maybe not as much resources as I have now, but, you know, I love the experience there and really good supportive administration as well as coaches there. But um, yeah, it was one that you had to work hard and grind for and you know, I think it was really neat to learn kind of um, through trials and, and, and error, if you will, and then being able to take that next step into a, a bigger conference and a bigger program you know, here at Fordham. But definitely, uh, you know, thankful for my time at Iona that helped me get to where I am today. Yeah, led him to the NCAAs as well. 2014, right? You got to go to Seattle, which is <laughs> I, I, the Seattle region, if I remember. That's not a that's not a bus trip. No, it's not. And it's ironic that 2019, we went back to the Seattle Regional. So yes. At least I was familiar with the UW scene. That is cool. I mean, think about that. You've been in two different schools. You've led them to the NCAAs. And if you've gone to the same regional, like, have you, have you wondered to yourself, like, what is it about me that they want me to go to Seattle so much? I think it was more so pairing, but uh, we definitely, I think we gave them more of a run for their money this time around than maybe yeah. back in, in 2014. Uh, but, you know, it was a great experience. They were awesome hosts over there and, you know, to play two competitive games over there against Washington 2-0 and, you know, Seattle 1-0, uh, you know, it was pretty neat uh, uh, NCAA regional for us. 
So you're, 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 you got things rolling at Iona, and then I'm sure you get wind that Coach Orchard is deciding to go back to her alma mater at Villanova. Perhaps you're, since you knew her, you weren't surprised by that, especially being her alma mater that she would leave. But still, to some people, that was kind of caught off guard because what she has built at Fordham for so long, it's so weird to see somebody leave. So take me through that, your mind, as that's developing, and then does it cross your mind that, wow, could Fordham be in my future here? Yeah, I think, you know, her and I stayed in touch and and we talked a lot during that couple of weeks period of where she was kind of going through the process at Villanova. And it was more so like, you know, what are you thinking? And I was like, well, in a heartbeat, I would definitely apply for that job, you know. So I was fortunate that, you know, she was able to kind of put my name forward, um, you know, and then uh, was was uh, must have interviewed well enough and, you know, had a, a had a good profile to come in. But uh, yeah, it was a pretty stressful couple of weeks because you weren't sure what was going on. And you know, you want to make sure that whatever the next job is, again, is, is somewhere you could be successful, that you have the resources, that it's a good fit. You know, and I loved it my first time around. It's a, if you've never been here before, Eric, it's a beautiful campus. It's very much like an Ivy League feel and everyone thinks, you know, it's the Bronx and it's literally like someone picked up an Ivy League campus and put it in the middle of the Bronx across the street from the zoo, across the street from the Botanical Gardens. And, uh, you know, I just love the academic balance and the competitiveness of Division one athletics, along with, you know, a quality student athlete experience from from the academic side. I think that's really that's really neat. And that's kind of more of how I was as a student. And I think Fordham definitely provides that opportunity and experience to our student athletes from the academic and athletic side, you know, versus maybe more athletic than academic. But I think it's a it's a perfect balance. And then you add in the culture and diversity piece um, here in New York City one of the biggest cities in the world. And then as well as the alumni uh, networking piece, you know, it's like, no matter where we go, we could be at a target in Orlando, Florida. And someone says that I'm a Fordham 1991 grad. And even, even yesterday I went, I went on a hike with my dog and here's a park ranger guy telling me he's a 2010 Fordham grad, you know, and go Rams. Uh, so it's pretty neat. Um, but I think Fordham is truly able to offer all those aspects, which is really cool from the recruiting perspective when we, when we try to, you know, bring in some new student athletes. Was there, did you feel any pressure following Coach Orchard there? And then, you know, taking over that program, you know, a lot of times it's a big transition going from one coach to another from a, from a player standpoint. Maybe it's not, it, but from the outside anyway, it seemed like it went smooth, obviously, uh, making the tournament and everything. Was it smooth? What was that like once you got the job and now you're like, whoa, you know, I'm following Coach Orchard and following that tradition that she's built. You've got these players, you inherit it, they're talented but I got to make sure they buy into what I'm doing. And, and how did that all process work out there? And how were you able to make it successfully work out so easy when a lot of times it, it takes a while? I think it helps too that even when I was at Iona, we played Fordham, you know, every year in a midweek game. So I was pretty familiar with, with players and tried to recruit a few of them. So it wasn't like I was totally foreign to who the players were, where they're from, you know, what kind of player they were. Um, so that, I think that helped in the transition because I had already known a few players either by trying to recruit them uh, whether they told me no at Iona or, or what have you, but I think that helped out right away. And then, you know, just getting on the phone and talking to them and getting to know them as people, I think was huge. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's always little bumps in the road, but, um, and there for sure was pressure. Um, but I think if anything, it, I took it more as an honor to, you know, kind of follow her and, and wanting to uphold the tradition and if not try to, you know, push the envelope and, and take it a little further. But I think having been an assistant before here, and knowing kind of the past and the tradition and who kind of came before us, I think is huge. And that's something that I definitely try to reiterate to our players. Um, we try to do a ton of alumni networking, um, especially now with this, all this Zoom stuff has been very, um, very cool for us to reconnect with people and engage with alumni. Um, but I think having that past as an assistant coach, I'm kind of tied in with the last decade, if you will, of players. So I think that definitely helps. And then just kind of getting on the field and, and getting after and developing relationships. I think that's huge. Um, but yeah, it's been awesome. You know, the, the team has been great. The, the administration, the, the support from the department. Um, but it's one that, you know, I think my staff and I had to make it our own too and not try to cookie cut and be, and be people that we're not. You know, I think we want to stay true to who we are and, and what we wanted to bring. So I think it was just a balance of taking what I wanted to do, what traditions we definitely wanted to keep and uphold because that is important. Um, but yeah, I think it's helpful that I, I kind of knew the past of Fordham beforehand, not coming in here blindly. What did you learn from Coach Orchard during your time with her that maybe you applied to your coaching philosophy or style? Because uh, I'm sure as you, you know, throughout your track, you know, to this journey, 
you picked up some things from coaches, whether you played for or coach with, et cetera. But I'm from Coach Orchard. Was there things you picked up that you use today? Uh, like, who were some of the influential coaches that you've kind of influenced through? Yeah, I think you know most recently having worked for work worked for her, um, you know her competitiveness. Uh, you know, you could see her clapping, jumping with the team. Uh, you know, I think her energy is contagious for sure, and it makes players want to play for her and and fight for her. Um, you know, her ability to to you know want to win at all costs, kind of thing. You know, and uh, game management, knowing maybe when to put in someone, even if it's maybe they're not the best statistical person, but. I think going by instincts. So I think those are definitely the two things that I learned from her the most, as well as continuing to schedule tough. I think that's something that Fordham in the last decade or so has definitely honed in on. And I think that's attributed to a lot of our consistent success is that we're not afraid to play tough, you know, to play a tough schedule. We might be seven and 15 heading into conference play, but we're definitely much more prepared. Um, and then my previous stops uh, when I was at Southern Miss, Coach Dobson learned a ton offensively from him you know, and the ability to prepare our hitters for different pitchers. And I think we still, I hold on to a lot of that prep work, if you will. Um, you know, he's as creative as they come. Obviously, he's at LSU as well, leading the offense down there, along with Lindsey Leftwich, who ironically was a player of mine at Northwestern State. My Whoa, first year, wow. first year of coaching, yeah. Um, but yeah, learned a lot of hitting from him and um, just prep work and the confidence piece. And then, um, you know, my only other boss that I really worked for was Eileen Schmidt at Northwestern State. And at Kentucky, you know, and, and for that, it was kind of definitely grateful and indebted to her because she took me as a 23 year old coach at Northwestern State and I was with her for 10 months and, and did, did well enough to come with her Kentucky for three years. But, you know, just just kind of letting me learn by, you know, trial and error, like letting me figure it out. She didn't hold my hand trying to figure things out. She literally would be like, all right, this is what I need to do or I need you to do. And then, you know, get back to me in two days kind of thing. So she was one that, um, you know, kind of, kind of threw me to the fire and let me figure it out. Um, you know, and I still keep in touch with all three of, all three of my previous um, bosses and mentors. So it's, it's been awesome to have such a great network that I can pick up the phone and call right now. And, and if I needed anything, they would be right there. That's kind of why I, I just realized that you're right. You're on Coach Dobson's staff at Southern Miss and you coached Leftwich at Northwestern State. Does that make you an unofficial Beth Torina tree member of some sorts there? I mean, that's kind of wild. I think Lindsay left, which was lefty is what we called her. She was a junior. Um, and I, where she, I think she was a senior, senior or junior, but either way, I was like, I'm late born in December. And I think I was one year older than Lindsay when she was a player at Northwestern State. And how she is today is how she was as a player. That fiery, you know, that talkative, that, you know, so uh, contagious in her energy and so motivating, you know, it's, it's pretty cool to see her not really change from when she was a player to where she is now as a, as a very successful assistant coach at a power five. Uh, it's been pretty cool. Like people are like, wait, you guys knew each other. I'm like, yeah, she was a player my very first year of coaching. <laughs> You know, we well, both kind of look the same now, you know, we haven't really aged maybe a couple sunspots, but, uh, <laughs> But other than that, it's, it's pretty cool that, you know, softball takes you around, you know, the country. And although everyone goes back to, you know, uh, kind of the same network and tree, if you will, it's, it's pretty neat. I'm very fortunate to have a really good network and, and coaching colleagues, if you will. It's been awesome. They just better promote you. Every time they talk, they better promote you there. Either that or help you out schedule. I mean, I mean I'm just saying. I mean, that's pretty, pretty good. And then the other thing I've noticed – you need to come back to Florida because Fordham used to play all the time at the UCF tournament. I've talked to mm -hmm. Kayla Lombardo about this and Coach Orchard about it. Yeah, you know, y'all would always come here all the time. It'll be like these tough nail biting games. And then, you know, even at Southern Miss when you were Coach Dobson, you would play because they were part of Conference USA. Mm -hmm. So it feels like once we get past this pandemic, I feel like your team, you're, you got to come back to Florida now. Yeah, we definitely want to, you know, hopefully we can get back to a normal preseason uh, non-conference schedule where we can, you know, take our flights and everything like that. Um, slowly trying to put together the 2021 or excuse me, the 22 schedule. But I think it's more important to just kind of get through each day right now. Oh, right I when, hear you. Right when you look ahead, something else, you know, a curveball is thrown at you again. No, I hear you on that. I definitely hear you on that day by day. Let's let's talk about this league because I think this league is so fascinating. You mentioned this year, two divisions. Uh, just discuss how that came about to decide to go to two divisions, the softball central, the softball north. I know geography plays, traveling plays a role in that, but it's created now some interesting storylines and then how that will uh, be affect as far as the conference tournament's concerned. Explain that for us. 
Yeah, on a normal year, you would take the top six um, teams in the league and then go to a conference tournament and, um, you know, one and two would get the bye, if you will. Uh, but this year, they decided to do two pods set up by Geographics just so that you, you know, limited flights, I believe only maybe St. Louis and maybe George Washington and George Mason have to do flights. And I think they maybe just have to do it once or something. So uh, geography definitely played a role in it. Um, it was a little weird knowing that St. Bonaventure is five and a half hours from us, but they're not in our side of the pod. So it was interesting. And um, originally it was only going to be three games. And then oh, I think we decided as coaches, I think it was like an eight to three vote that, you know, we said, let's do the four game series because I think at the time when we had to kind of make a decision, some schools weren't sure if they were going to be able to play non-conference or not. So then you looked at like, oh God, we're only going to play 16 or 18 games. And I think for some coaches, it was like, I don't know if my kids are going to continue to come back for 18 games, you know? So, um, but yeah, I went to um, a four game series. Um, like I said, you have the flexibility to do double, double or one, two, one format. And then now you'll take the top two of each pod and go to a four team double elimination tournament. And I think the top, the top team um, is the host as of right now, or, will be the host, but who knows, things could probably change, you know, but that is kind of the format right now moving forward. Well, and it's significant because you're having a strong year from the league standpoint. George Washington's playing great ball. Coach Winkler's done a great job there. Uh, they're doing all – they're a fantastic start over there. You got George Mason's playing good softball there. St. Joseph is playing good. I mean, this league – just talk about this league because obviously it doesn't get a lot of the national attention, but this has always been a very competitive league. I mean, everybody that, that's a longtime softball fan remembers the rivalry of UMass and Fordham. But there's more to that now in this league. It's grown, and it, it's a tough league. And usually the team that comes out of the A-10 ends up at a regional, and that host is not happy to see them. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a widespread conference, you know. I think it's known more so for offense, for sure. Because if you look by per teams, there are some teams that can hit. GW, like you mentioned, um, you know, they've – always since he's gotten there they've been a strong offensive team for sure and Shane and I go way back when I was at Kentucky he was at Marshall so you know we've known each other for a long time and then Justin's done a great job in the interim over there George uh, Mason you know um, he seems to be bringing in some new energy and some newness to the program and then you've got you know veteran coach Christy Knoyer over there at St. Louis as well as Kara over there at Dayton um, then, you know, you've got Christy at UMass, like you said, the rivalry. So, um, and then Aaron, who's actually Aaron at St. Joe's is a Fordham alum. So uh, there's a little bit of connection there, but it kind of just, I think each team is um, dependent on the style and personality of the coach for sure. I think that's how each team is, but I would say it's more of an offensive conference um, than anything, but it's, it'll be interesting because we're not going to see half the conference. You know, we're more or less just concerned with our pod right now and, and you know, day by day, week by week, and we go from there. Um, but it's interesting just kind of, you know, uh, looking from afar, like how everyone's doing, because um, we all had different parameters. Some were able to travel in the preseason and some were not, you know. Uh, so it's interesting as uh, April will be kind of an important month to really see, because I know some people are playing the most games right now in April um, versus maybe other teams started in, you know, late February. I think uh, St. Louis and Dayton maybe in Rhode Island were the first couple teams that were actually able to play in February. Everyone else was March. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how this month unfolds. Can this league be a multiple bid league? It's been before in the past with, before, yeah. as mentioned, Fordham and UMass. So it has that history. It's hosted regionals in the past. Can this league be a multiple bid league once again here moving forward in the future with the, pro the coaches that you've talked about and the programs you've got currently? Yeah, I think us coaches have talked about wanting it to be a two bid league. You know, when we do our coaches calls and, kind of really emphasizing to each other, like, hey, let's, uh, we get it, you want some wins early, but the stronger competition that we can play helps out our whole makeup as a conference, RPI-wise. It's interesting that we're actually still doing the RPI this year, um, even though that's kind of like a weird uh, metric, if you will, because I don't know if it's indicative this year because right. of so many restrictions. I actually serve on the East Region Regional Committee thing, and it's interesting to hear other coaches, you know, opinion on the RPI and um, how you've got a team that might be 25 and two, but their RPI is like 125, you know, but then you've got a team that's eight and 11 and their RPI is 30, you know? So it's interesting to see kind of what happens because correct me if I'm wrong, I think is it men's and women's basketball did away with the RPI? Correct. This year? They've gone to the net 
uh, ranking. So they have a quad system and they have their own unique formula and, you know, top, you know, win it, you know, on the road against the top 50 or top 75 and things like that. But clearly, and I've said this on the podcast, you know, the fact that basketball, both men and women have decided that the RPI is not good enough for us, that we need a new system to fit, help pick the selections. To me, that should be a, a, an alarm there, I think, to softball that, well, if, if, the, if the RPI is not good enough for basketball, why should it be good enough for us? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens in the next few weeks because that dialogue has already kind of been happening on these regional committee calls. You know, we've been saying like, oh, hey, this team's doing really well, but they've only been able to play people in their region. So we don't know how they would have done against someone down south, you know, or in the Midwest because that just that wasn't where they're at as administration. Um, so it'll be interesting to see kind of if things change. I know they just decided on predetermined, you know, regional and super regional hosts, which again will be interesting because you might have someone put it a bid and they might not make the postseason and they still got to host the regional, you yeah. know, so it's going to be interesting. I, I don't know. I, I, we were hoping that, you know, with more vaccines, um, people getting vaccinated, that things are going to be, um, you know, heading in a positive, you know, closer to normal direction, but you know, what is normal these days? So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see kind of what unfolds in the next few weeks, Eric. Um, but, you know, that's your job to cover it. My job is just to you know, <laughs> go to practice and, and do some games. <laughs> I'll keep you in the loop, I guess. Uh, you know, I am interested, though. I mean, you mentioned the predetermined sites. That's obviously going to be a, to it's a hot topic now. Uh, not necessarily this year, but in the future. You mentioned your facilities. You're very, you, you feel very proud of that. Could in the future, could you host a regional if you were in position where you felt, hey, we deserve to host a regional? Because – you know, I think that's the one thing, that, you know, Sapa used to be, you know, UMass used to host, Hofstra used to host. It was a different time. Uh, but I think it would be great for the sport if we sprinkled in some hosting in the Northeast. Like one of the memorable games I'll never forget was 2009, I believe, when Washington came oh, yeah, and played yeah. UMass, right? Mm -hmm. And they had that marathon game with Daniel Laurie, and it was on the computer and the UMass website. I know the game is blown up from a coverage standpoint, but that's like one of my favorite games ever. And think about, you know, that really added a lot of exposure. That was the first time I heard of UMass softball, to be honest, at the time, because I was kind of getting into softball at the time. So I think it would help the Northeast if we got more of that. Obviously justified, you know, you don't want, you know, nobody wants to be handed anything. But from your standpoint, could you host a regional do, moving down the road if you're in position to be in the mix to host? I think that would be an amazing, like, part of our vision, you know, in the future. Uh, yeah, you might have to bring in maybe some stands for the outfield. Um, but I think why not? Like, you know, this, this softball is a, is a national sport, not just a regional sport, you know, it's a national sport and there's a lot of really nice facilities. I mean, you, uh, UConn in the big East, you know, just built this tremendous softball stadium, you know, and you've even have a couple Ivy league schools that have tremendous facilities. Um, Binghamton in the America East, just to name a few offhand right now, but you know, unfortunately maybe some of those Northeast schools with a really good facility only get like eight to 10 game home games a year. You know, so it would be awesome, you know, in the future, if it can get back to, like you said, the Hofstra and the UMasses that have hosted before in the future, we would love to, you know, be able to um, put in a bid for it and, and to, you know, host one. I think that would be amazing. And I think that would be awesome for the sport as well. So those East Coast student athletes that play softball, you know, don't have to go across, you know, the ocean to go play or across the, the coast to play. We'd love to keep all the good talent sure. right here in the area. I know baseball coaches, they're trying to push to have their season start later in March because of weather and get to have an opportunity to play more home games up north. Is that something that's been discussed among your coaches? Is that something you would be in favor of moving the season back to March? Or what, what's your thoughts on that? Do you, could you see softball doing that? You know, I thought actually the NCAA was going to step up and make a March 1st blanket date, to be honest, but they didn't. You know, um, I thought if anything, one year to try it would have been this year yeah. um in the past conventions we have talked about pushing the season back but it's always kind of come down to um the espn contracts if you will and and softball not having to battle with the nba and how the viewership is awesome already and that they didn't want to play with the weekends um but i know when i played it was 64 game schedule you know you were able to play 64 games and right. that was just the season you know so now you're at 56 um i think i think some coaches We've never been able to come to a decision. I think it's always been split. Like some, you know, want a 50 game schedule. And then it's like, some are like, I don't think my school is going to pay for us to stay, you know, once school's over. And uh, the argument is, well, they do that for soccer and volleyball and football and baseball. So why wouldn't they do it for us? So I'm not sure what it's going to take um, to move it. But I mean, softball has grown so much. And for us to have 
I think we're one of the few collegiate sports that gets every regional, super regional and World Series on the ESPN um, family of network. Yep. You know, that's amazing. I can't tell you how many of my friends that post soccer, volleyball, lacrosse are like, you guys are like almost spoiled. You get everything. And I'm like, I think it's supposed to show you how cool the game is. You but know? We've, right, but we've earned it because we have the popularity. We've, they've produced numbers. I mean, I cover mm-hmm. that very closely and the numbers, and they draw big numbers TV-wise for the Women's College World Series. It's outdrawn the Stanley Cup final in the past. It's outdrawn college baseball. Mm-hmm. It's outdrawn Major League Baseball. Uh, so it's it's warranted. It's, they're, they're putting it for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um I'm selfish because I cover both the NBA and college softball. And I, and I remember being at Oklahoma city covering that. And then on my monitor, I have an NBA finals game. So I would actually prefer softball get pushed back. So I didn't have to conflict with the NBA postseason. <laughs> but I'm selfish. So I acknowledge that. Uh, but that's for others to decide, but it is interesting conversations that's been taking place in the sport. Let's kind of bring it back to the immediate future here for you. Moving forward here. What's going to be the keys here as I kind of give you the last couple of questions here. What's going to be the keys for your team moving forward here to continue this successful run you're going and accomplish your internal goals here, which obviously is winning, trying to win the A-10 championship and get back to the tournament? Yeah, you know, I think my staff and I and our team, we're very, um, you know, routine oriented. We like consistency. Um, you know, we have a kind of a set plan each week on when we're, you know, doing our COVID testing and what our practice layout is in the midweek games. Um, so we're just looking to continue to stay day by day. Um, you know, game by game. We don't really want to look too far ahead and we're really just trying to stay present in the moment. Uh, that's something that I know our, our mental performance coach, Liv Massey with Sports Strata has really helped us with this year. And, and I think our players have really tried to really embrace and enjoying every moment, you know, because we know how quick it was going to be taken away. But just staying healthy and managing bodies, you know, if, if there's an inning that I can take off from one of the pitchers and give somebody else some work, then we'll do that. Or, you know, try to give other people some opportunities, whether it's a pinch hit or a start here or there, but just trying to keep everyone as fresh and ready. Um, you know, I think, and, but honestly, just going back to a uh, uh, pitch by pitch mentality and game by game, that's kind of what we really want to focus on is just, you know, what's the next thing in, head of, in, in front of us. Well, uh, we certainly will look forward to seeing how your season unfolds there. But uh, in the meantime, I appreciate you uh, taking the time from the busy schedule uh, to talk to us. I know a uh, tremendous job you've done there. Obviously we followed you since Iona and obviously I followed you specifically since Southern Miss days, but that's what we don't need to outdate ourselves a little bit there. Uh, coach, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a blast to talk to you. Good luck the rest of the way. And we'll definitely uh, talk soon. Thanks for your time, Eric. And thanks for the coverage that you, uh, you do for college uh, softball. Much appreciated and go Rams.